Hello, hello. Welcome or welcome back to Spellbound. I'm BJ the Book Witch, and this is an episode of Tabled Content. This is where we look at books as artifacts within current discourse. So that's a lot of words. What does that mean? Basically means we're looking at current books and talking about why they're relevant right now. And this episode is on building a decolonized reading list. So knowing where to start and how to navigate the daunting and at times self-challenging journey of decolonizing. All right, so to start us off, let's get on the same page with the word decolonizing. If you're not already familiar with this word or if this word makes you feel nervous or agitated or uncomfortable, then chances are you might be a little misinformed about what it really means. Regardless of what any TV personality may tell you, decolonizing our mindsets and our systems of economy, education, government, and community is not about making white people feel bad for being white. It's not. It's about recognizing the way that our history and our foundation still impacts our present. That's it. Because the truth is, we live in a colonized society. And that's a fact that I didn't really understand until my late college years. When I first learned about colonization, I learned about the Age of Exploration, and Cortez, and Columbus, and the last reaches of the Empire of Great Britain as it colonized India and Africa. And when I pictured colonization, I pictured distant histories or militant occupations of places that I have never been and will probably never go to. But it was actually in my first Lit Theory grad school class that I really started to understand what colonization even meant. And that's because I started looking at it in a way that made sense to me, through books. And instead of studying the history of it, which can feel very detached and removed from our current way of living, we studied the literature of it and we studied the art of it. How were people expressing themselves? How did they define themselves? Especially generations later, after the colonization happened, how were people identifying and defining their own culture when another culture had been imposed upon them? Those are hard questions, but they are human questions. And they're about real people living today, right now. And so that's why it helped me understand the concept of colonization, because through books, it moved from the theoretical and the historical, and it became humanized through art and through the lived existence of real people who are alive today, like us. And when we apply that sense of empathy and that shared sense of humanity to the peoples and individuals in our own communities, state, and country, we can see why the conversation around decolonization has become so much more prescient. The United States is a colonized nation. We literally started as the colonies. And so that fact, along with the foundational steps that we took in establishing the colonies from eradicating the native peoples already living here to then shipping over an entirely new enslaved population as a labor force, both play a heavy role in the culture of present day America. This video is not, and I am not going to go into all the ways that we still are a colonized nation and how that is to everybody's detriment. A, because Google is free, but B, because hundreds of other authors, doctors, social scientists, historians, and activists have already done so. And that is what this video is about. This video is mainly targeted at fellow white readers who want to understand a little bit more about why there is such a palpable tension in this country, especially when everything that we may encounter says otherwise. You know, when we grow up learning that slavery was in the past and this isn't a racist country and that we have equal opportunity here in America, and most of all, that this is the land of the free. I get it. I've been there too. Growing up as a teenager and even as a young adult, I would get genuinely confused and deeply hurt by claims that said otherwise. But books helped me understand. And now that this is what I do for a living, I write corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings for our organizations. I have read and it is my responsibility to continue to read a lot. So in this video, I'll be sharing a list of book recommendations with a high level overview of what distinguishes these books from each other and how far they go in each direction. 
This is by no means a comprehensive list. It is simply a list of the books that I have personally engaged with. And admittedly, they are more race focused than ethnicity focused because that has been the trajectory of my experience so far. So let's get started. White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. This is my recommended start here. And here's why. It's written by a white lady. Now, wait, why should that matter? Shouldn't we be reading books by black authors? Yes, and that's why this is one of like maybe two books out of this whole list that's written by a white author. But the reason that I have this book listed first is actually what her entire book is all about, which is how white people react and respond when confronted with the idea of racism and the idea that racism is still present. A lot of feelings happen, and they come up all at once. Feelings of discomfort, defensiveness, aggression, frustration, denial, um, sympathy, maybe, guilt, maybe. All these feelings happen all at once, and they are very uncomfortable, and for the most part, very new to us and to our experience. The most important part of all of that is that all those feelings and that feelings overwhelm causes us as white people to shut down when encountering those feelings. And we don't have to talk about why that is and go into actually scientifically what the amygdala hijack is when we have feelings overwhelm and like how that process plays out. Just know that that is what happens to us because as white people, we grow up conditioned to understand this idea of racism as something that belongs in the past. It feels like an anachronism for present day. It's something that belongs and makes sense in the past, and if it does happen in present day, then it is not of us, it is separate from us. It's something that we don't participate in, it's something we don't contribute to, and it's something that we see our size, um, ourselves as on the opposite side of. So when we are confronted with the idea that it's actually very present and that we are somehow connected to or involved or participating in or perpetuating or benefiting from, that starts the, the more that we become connected with this idea of racism, the more those feelings start to come up and we want to shut that down. This is literally why you have uneducated parents on PTA boards or the fascist Moms for Liberty groups literally removing children's books from children's schools for no other reason than, and I quote, making kids feel bad for being white. That is this phenomenon at play. It is a lot of discomfort and it's a lot of discomfort that we have to acknowledge, identify, and then work through in order to move forward with an open mind. This is literally emotional intelligence 101. As soon as we have big feelings, we have to be able to acknowledge and identify these big feelings so that we can move forward and continue to have productive dialogue and open communication with people who think and feel differently from us. But all of these feelings, everything that those parents are feeling, everything that we may feel when we learn for the first time, that not only do we still currently, not in the past, but present day, live in a racist society, but actually perpetuate and benefit from that racist society, those feelings that we have, not us, not us, not me, there's a term for that, and it's called white fragility. D'Angelo puts words and context around the real experience of white people learning about racism for the first time. And that can be helpful and soothing, but also encouraging. Now, make no mistake, she doesn't coddle her readers. This book is not, it's okay to be white, nobody's mad at you kind of book. If you, as a person, really need that, you could go to church or your local sheriff's office fundraiser. But she does put words and understanding around the very intangible but very real big feelings that white people have when we first start to learn about racism in the present. And that's a very important first step. How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. I would recommend reading this book alongside or right after D'Angelo. This book puts into plain terms why learning about racism matters in the first place. And it's from the perspective of a black author who explains the complexities of today's racism in a way that's easy to understand, but also in a way that's easy to understand your role in it. Because make no mistake, we are all involved here. We all have a role to play, whether it's one that we are assigned or one that we choose to take on. And that's what this book is about. Because when you live in an environment that was designed to be racist and that it was designed to uphold and benefit one race and oppress and suppress another, then you are either choosing to go along with and perpetuate and potentially benefit from that system or you are choosing to challenge and disrupt that system. 
Because in a racist society, in a racist environment, simply saying, but I'm not a racist, I'm not one, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't hold any water. You are either racist and participating in that system or anti-racist. And if you are anti-racist, then you are choosing to continually challenge and disrupt that system. It's an either or. You're either part of the system or you're not. So you want to talk about race by Ijeoma Oluo. After you read How to Be an Anti-Racist, you may feel inspired. And I hope that you do. And so this book kind of pulls us out of that theory headspace and puts us more into that action headspace. This book is a sort of white folks catch up and really explains in plain language the current state of racial tension in America. And it answers a lot of those basic first questions. Why is everything so tense? Why is everybody mad at police all of a sudden? Why is everybody mad at their politicians even if they're the, the ones who voted for them? Why is there so much unrest? All of that. And it also offers some very straightforward language around the Black Lives Matter movement, how it was founded, what it is now, and clears up some no doubt misconceptions that you may have heard about it. Lies My Teacher Told Me by James W. Lowen. It may help to read this book alongside So You Want to Talk About Race. This is an easy to read, and I think the original is written for children, textbook, and it's a textbook account of American history. There are several different versions of this, some written for a younger audience and some even for an older audience, but the first and original is a textbook for around middle grade students of a basic account of American history. Because So You Want to Talk About Race talks about the way that current systems continue to oppress peoples can be very helpful if we have a more broadened or really basic understanding of American history and understand how those systems and why they were put into place in the first place. Because the systems today are the same systems that were originally put in place during slavery days and they're operating ex exactly the way they were in designed and intended. And so it also helps us understand understand that this isn't new and this isn't bad apples. This isn't bad eggs in the system that are manipulating our current society in order to benefit one or the other. They're the same systems that were put in place then, but we don't really understand them. I grew up in public education and we didn't go over the way that the criminal justice system works and how it was designed and intended. We don't really go over the tech system and the way that it was designed and intended. And we don't really go over the way that voting works um, and how our elected officials are put into office anyway. And so all of these systems, government, economy, commerce, education, communities, all of the all of these systems that are currently part of our environment, we did not learn growing up in school, really um, their inception. And so it can be a little bit more difficult to understand how not a lot has changed and how they con are continuing to uphold white supremacy. So that's why I recommend having them both at once to get that well-rounded education so that we're understanding the systems from the root um, instead of understanding the systems in terms of the results, which we are conditioned to believe is because of bad racist individuals instead of racist systems. And then from there, it really just depends on where you want to take your education next. Mine took me straight to the core of my childhood religion and identity as a Southern uh, Baptist Christian, um, which I no longer identify as, and really rounded out the end of my deconstructing era. White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity by Dr. Robert P. Jones. This book was my favorite book out of all the others that I read and will talk about, and that's because I interacted with this book a little bit differently. So this book did not present an idea or a concept that I had to learn and engage with outside of myself or my experience, which is a lot of what learning about racism as a white person is. As a white person, when we learn about racism, we're learning about an idea or a concept that exists outside of ourselves, at least to our perception. Because our white privilege means that we will never experience firsthand what it is like to be oppressed systemically by our skin color because all of our systems that we currently have are meant to benefit us. So we don't have a lived experience for, under for understanding that. We're relying on three different things to happen. When we learn about racism, we're relying on our education and our cognitive ability to simply understand what people are saying. I can understand in theory, how these systems exist and how they live and work. We're relying on our perception and our lens and viewpoint of how we view the world to make sense of what we are seeing and learning and also how those systems currently affect us 
differently and we're relying on our emotional intelligence and our empathy to potentially build any bridges between the two of the way that that system affects us and our lived experience and the way that that system that I cognitively understand also impacts someone else inversely. So we're relying on all three of these things happening all at once. But this book doesn't function that way. At least it did not for me. This book presents comprehensive statistical analysis data that studies and shows that white evangelical Christians are the most racist and white supremacist identifying population in the country and then shows through history how that came to be in the first place. So this book studies and look looks back on the history of white evangelical Christianity and shows how and when white evangelical Christianity became synonymous with white supremacy. And as someone who grew up deeply ensconced in generations of Southern Baptist Christianity, I found this book fascinating because it also showed me the history of my my own childhood religion that I didn't know and how Southern Baptist Christianity actually was founded and why and theologically all of it. It also used present day um, current statistical analysis to show and explain in layman's terms um, how this religion of white evangelical Christianity, how the religion affects its members' political scopes, worldviews, and racist lenses, and presents itself and is written in a colonized and colonizing mindset. Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation by Kristen Cobes Dume. This book is almost an inverse of the previous. So this book was actually written by an historian, whereas White Too Long was written by a social scientist and a personal deconstructing Christian. So this book looks back through history American history, and really looks specifically at politics and political parties and at what specific moments and key intersections politicians, either depending on your viewpoint, infiltrated the church or really just realigned their platform with talking points from the church, realizing that the unique and manufactured lens of white evangelical Christianity creates a population of vulnerable and easily manipulatable voters. And at what key points in American history, the white evangelical Christian church became synonymous with the Republican political party. If you are a deconstructing Christian, or if you are a religious person who currently identifies as a Christian and are only just starting to critically engage and analyze the foundations of your faith in order to literally deconstruct and then rebuild, I would recommend taking these two books in this order and taking them slowly. Fortunately, I had already read these books beyond my deconstructing journey and had already come to the conclusion that I could no longer comfortably identify as a practicing Christian. In fact, these books helped me intellectualize and then articulate why I could no longer align myself spiritually with the Christian ideology. But had I not been there already emotionally, this might have been a much tougher journey for me. So I encourage you to take these books at your own pace, breathe, drink water, and continue to pray as you read these books and question them and learn as much as you can about the history of the foundations of whatever faith you currently practice. I think regardless of religion and regardless of ideology, that's pretty sage advice to understand the context surrounding the foundations of any faith. Wait too long will make you grapple and ask difficult questions about your theology. And Jesus and John Wayne will make you grapple with your political ideology as it is aligned with your religion. The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity and Racism by Jamar Tisby. This one is similar, but it paints a broader scope of the American church instead of just focusing on evangelical Christianity. And it puts all of this into the context of today's current political scope. So it's kind of like a conversation between White Too Long, Jesus, and John Wayne, and So You Want to Talk About Race. I recommend reading it after White Too Long and Jesus and John Wayne, not because it presents new information that scaffolds off of the other two, because it doesn't. In fact, it simplifies and summarizes the main points of both, and then puts both into the context of today's political environment, making it relevant now, like today. Um, and it's also not a difficult read. We can't talk about that at work. 
How to Talk About Race, Religion, Politics, and Other Polarizing Topics by Mary Frances Winters. This one is obviously geared toward the workplace, and it's okay. The thing is, even though it was published in 2017, this book isn't as current or as relevant as it needs to be for today's workplace environment. That doesn't mean that this book isn't worth the read. Of course it is. But this book is more geared toward how to create open doorways for which open dialogue can occur. And of course, that's important and a necessary first step. However, in 2023, in a, a largely remote work environment, if those steps haven't already taken place, then your organization is probably in more diversity trouble than you think it is. Um, because what is currently the conversation now is not so much about how can we create safe space environments, but how can we empower our leaders and our team members to initiate and continue and further these conversations on these difficult and necessary topics that are in fact already happening. So if there isn't already a, an in culture language and support system for these dialogues to occur then they're happening outside the context of the organization and that's never really a good sign for an organization's healthy diversity culture and i haven't yet encountered a book that really presents those active strategies for empowering leaders and team members on how to have these conversations there's just they're more theory based and they're more on safe space building which is my terminology not the book's terminology um, but there are other, many, many other great resources. LinkedIn Learning is a great one, but um, there are other resources that really dive into those strategies that I have seen have been successful in a workplace environment. And we can talk about those later, but that's just different. So no, I haven't found the perfect book on this topic yet. But either way, I definitely recommend it because it does make these somewhat intimidating topics and tensions relevant in a way that is different from the last three books that I just talked about, which deal with the church and religion specifically. Hello! So I know no time has passed for you, but I just got back from a lovely Friday night date with my partner, so let's continue. Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum? In fact, I just finished this one pretty recently and talked about it in my Black History Month wrap-up right here. This one is unique because it shows where and how the awareness of racism shows up in children, adolescents, and into adulthood, contrasted between white individuals and families and by POC individuals and families. Using decades and decades of psychological data, it shows how identities and identity groups are formed along the lines of race and how BIPOC individuals become aware of that fact at different developmental stages, but that white individuals remain ignorant to that fact until closer to adulthood when those lines have already been drawn. So not only was this book super interesting, but it also introduced moments and strategies for how to have age-appropriate conversations with your kids or your friends about race based on what they're currently seeing and experiencing around them and their peers. It also had an about 100-page introduction talking about how this book was originally written in the mid-90s, but despite that, everything else in this book is still exactly the same and perfectly relevant, which was disheartening. But what was even more disheartening was the fact that this republication date was actually in 2016 before shit hit the fan when Trumpet was elected. So we are in fact moving in a backwards direction in terms of race and race relations. Um, just last week, I think Tennessee passed a bill allowing government officials to deny interracial marriages, among other things. So trajectory is not looking super great at this point. The next two books are books that I have not read yet, but they are on my TBR and they are the next steps on my decolonizing journey. The Whiteness of Wealth by Dorothy Brown. This book looks at the American tax system and the way that it works to oppress and impoverish Black Americans. And The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. This book looks at the American ju criminal justice system and the ways that it works as designed to oppress, impoverish, and ultimately withhold the right to vote from Black Americans. Now, I started this video talking about how reading literature and engaging with art helped me understand the concept of decolonization, and yet all I've done is throw nonfiction at you. Um, and I did that for a reason, because these books contain information and education that we were never given in America, um, and that we're not going to get unless we seek it. And it's so, so necessary that we do so that we can understand the complexities and the nuance when we see it, like 
out in the wild and we can have a language and terminology to identify it. That's empowering. But art helps us with that connective tissue. Engaging with art and literature and reading books helps us grow in our humanity. It increases our emotional intelligence. Storytelling connects people and storytelling connects peoples. So with that said, here are five great examples of decolonizing literature. Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. This is a contemporary new adult fiction novel about a black babysitter and her well-intentioned white employer. Back in 2020, I had a book club with my extended family and aside from, and we read this book, and aside from it being a very interesting page turner with a really compelling voice and narrator, um, it provided really safe as an impersonal um, spaces and contexts for which we could engage with these potentially difficult topics. Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. This is the book that I read in my lit theory class that taught me how to think. This is the debut novel of the acclaimed Nigerian author and it is account an account of pre-colonial life in Nigeria and then the invasion and colonization of his country in the late 1800s. This book was an incredible book on its own but it was a defining book for me. The Twelve Tribes of Hattie by Ayana Mathis. This is a beautiful story about the lives of the children of Hattie Shepard after she flees Georgia and settles in Philadelphia. It's told asynchronously and each chapter focuses on a different child with Hattie herself being a sort of supporting role in each of the chapters. So they all work together and weave together to create a portrait of the character of Hattie as well as the character of America itself. A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. This is a very short creative nonfiction speaking directly to you, the reader, and the tourist. And through this letter to you, it perfectly defines and describes colonization in a nutshell and also why it continues to be so relevant to the lived experience of people all over the world. If you're really struggling with simply defining colonization, this is a really great book. Um, that I would recommend maybe even having as your starting point. It's only 80 pages, it can easily be read in a single sitting, and it is very accessible. And finally, A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. This is a contemporary YA fantasy about a black teenager who is a siren in a world where it is almost illegal to be one. It's a clear allegory for the lived experience of black women in America, and it has strong themes of sisterhood, identity, action, and voice. This book, for as hard as it hits, is also a delightful and enchanting read. I read it last month and I absolutely loved it. So those were 16 recommendations for your decolonizing journey. I hope that these books empower you with a new perspective or a stronger understanding or a more precise context and vocabulary or a renewed sense of urgency and empathy. Our environment is already polarized. Our systems continue to uphold white supremacy because that's the way that they were designed. And our current political landscape is on a trajectory to not only move us backwards, but to move us more fully in line with the system's intended design. Knowledge is power, which is why the first step of any fascist regime is to target education and books, just like we're seeing in public education institutions from elementary schools to universities all over the country, but especially in the South, especially here in Florida. And just yesterday, the Republican Party seized control of an entire school district in Houston. I'm not making this up. So fight back and read and ask questions and get embarrassed and read some more. Get angry, drink water, and as always, happy reading.